Hi. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> so we're uh, we have at the sixth niche conversation, and I'm Jessica Dewitt. I'm one of the editors of the Network and Community History and Environment, and today I'm joined by Mercedes Peters. If you'd like to tell us more about yourself. Uh, yeah, so um, my name is Mercedes. I'm a third year PhD student in history at the University of British Columbia. Um, and I'm a band member of Blue Cat First Nation. So it's a community about 45 minutes or so outside of Halifax. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I do. Awesome. I hang out in my house. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> um. So I invited you here today because you wrote an article for us earlier this week, uh, Settler Forgetting in Sanyaville, the Sabaganagadik Mi'kmaq Fishery as a reminder. Um, so I thought we'd start our conversation off just by talking about what the Peace and Friendship Treaties are and why they are important to the Mi'kmaq people. Yeah, um, so the Peace and Friendship Treaties are a series of treaties that the Mi'kmaq signed with the British crown uh, between like 1725, 1726 and 1779. And the reason why a lot of those treaties are hyphenated is because, so for example, take 1725 and 1726, um, we're part of an alliance called the Wabanaki Confederacy. And those early treaties were signed by our allies and then brought up to us in our territory to ratify a year later. So that's why there are those like hyphenated years. Yeah. Um, but two of the main sets of treaties that keep getting brought up in this particular situation with Sveg and Agadee and the moderate livelihood fishery is the Treaty of 1750 and the Treaty of 1760-61. Mm-hmm. And those are the treaties that, among other things, because it's not just about hunting and fishing rights, but those are the ones that you see come up in Mi'kmaq court cases um, in Canada in the 20th and the 21st century. Um, so those are the treaties that kind of ensure Mi'kmaq right to hunt, to fish, to have that moderate livelihood that uh, the Canadian government has defined. Mm-hmm. Um, but more than that, because we tend to focus on hunting and fishing as like an economic matter, it's about protecting Mi'kmaq right to be Mi'kmaq and live as Mi'kmaq. So it isn't just hunting and fishing. It's about, you know, letting us be who we are undisturbed. And mm-hmm. based on probably what you're seeing right now, those treaties have been ignored pretty well since day one. So <laughs> here we are. <laughs> yes, thank you for that explanation. And I think that's a really important point under a capitalist system. We focus on the economics and we don't think about how this is a, this is a cultural issue. This is, this is an identity issue. Um, so in your post, you talk, um, you bring up burnt church, the burnt church crisis, and you call back to this crisis. Um, and this is something that I, as an American immigrant in the last 10 years, I had never heard of this crisis. So um, something that I learned in your piece. And I wonder if you want to talk about what it, that was and how it relates to what's going on. Currently. Yeah. Um, so the first thing um, I noticed when stuff got tense, <laughs> understatement of the century, um, with the Spaganagadi fishery, um, was burnt church. It was the first thing I came to mind. And I think I actually tweeted, Jesus, I hope this doesn't become another burnt church. And mm-hmm. here we are. Um, but so burnt church started in the direct aftermath of the RV Marshall decision that happened in 1999. And things got pretty violent in burnt church almost 21 years to the day that they got pretty violent here. So around October 3rd is when things started getting really bad. But essentially, after the Marshall decision went down that said Mi'kmaq had a right to like a moderate livelihood fishery, um, uh, Mi'kmaq fishers from Eskinobadich First Nation, known as Burnt Church at the time, there's also a village in the area named Burnt Church, which is why they call it the Burnt Church Crisis. Um, They took to the water. They started fishing um, because it was our right to do it. And the Supreme Court had started kind of understanding that we had it. And we thought, okay, cool, we'll go in. We won't have any trouble. Yeah. So um, what we saw with Burnt Church is there were Mi'kmaq boats out on the water. And then around October 3rd, we saw kind of a fleet of 150 um, like non-Indigenous boats from the commercial fishery out on the water to stop it. Um, there were attacks on Mi'kmaq equipment, just like you see um, that's happening in Sanyaville. Mm-hmm. Um, Mi'kmaq vehicles were lit on fire. There were shots fired. Um, People were injured um, and there was retaliation on both sides. It got messy. 
Um, and it went on for three years. So what was happening was the year that it first occurred, um, commercial fishers uh, actually took their plight to the Supreme Court. And not a lot of people know this, but there's a decision called Marshall 2 that happened after Marshall 1. And it was Canada's kind of attempt to rein in Marshall 1. Um, and so they essentially said, okay, you know, Mi'kmaq have a right to fish, but in the name of conservation, we can control it. That's not treaty. That's not something that they can do, but it was to appease fishers in the area. Um, and that didn't stop Mi'kmaq from being out on the water because that was a settler state attempt to kind of bind um, Mi'kmaq rights and it continued to get worse. Um, DFO started um, seizing Mi'kmaq equipment at night. Um, the RCMP took their boats under the water. Uh, DFO vehicles were ramming and running over Mi'kmaq vehicles trying to knock Mi'kmaq fishers under the water. Um, and then there was a back and forth. Government was claiming that Burnt Church wasn't coming to the table. Uh, Mi'kmaq were coming to the table to try to get it solved. And I say in the article that it remains open because it kind of did. So at the very end, 2003, I think, don't quote me on that. You're going to have to Google it. Um, there was something called an agreement in principle signed. And so uh, DFO and a bunch of Mi'kmaq got together and DFO essentially said, you can fish, but you can't sell it. And you can't, you know, give it to anybody else, which was a kind of settler state attempt to rein in what they had started to recognize. Um, again, that's breaking treaty because it also in the treaty, if people are like taking a look, it does say that we can sell um, if you wanted to get technical. But there's a lot of confusion, I think, with Marshall and with what happened in the aftermath of Burnt Church because a lot of folks will say those treaties grant Mi'kmaq rights. The treaties don't grant us rights. We already had them. And that's why I kind of frame it as a remembering because that's not what they are. We have rights that predate Canada. And so every time Canada tries to define what a moderate livelihood is, they're ignoring the point of the treaties. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's the lowdown on Burnt Church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I mean, as I mentioned, like, myself as a, a Canadian historian who has a PhD uh, has never heard of Burn Church, so that's a problem, right? Um, but then also it seems what I what I've been witnessing is that, you know, a lot of Canadians who are from the East Coast, etc., don't remember it either. And it wasn't that long ago, right? So that kind of plays into this idea of memory and, and forgetting. And um, so I just want to as you mentioned a little bit, your article frames the current conflict in terms of memory. Um, so I wonder if you want to talk a bit more about why memory is important and perhaps um, what our, respons our responsibility is both um, for Indigenous peoples as well as settlers to kind of nurture a shared or collective memory. Yeah, um, so I think part of the reason why I focus on memory so much, aside from being a history student, is that memory is crucial to who we are as Mi'kmaq. And I, in part, or for the most part, it has to be because we live in a world that's determined to kind of wipe us out, whether that's culturally, physically, politically, um, be, at, like existing as a nation, there's an attempt to completely undermine that too. Mm -hmm. um, we have to remember for ourselves so that A, we don't get pushed out of existence, but B, it's part of our culture, it's part of who we are. And so a lot of who we are, what we understand ourselves to be, what we understand the world to be is passed down from generations before us. We are a memory-based culture, but we're a culture that also kind of sees history as something that collides with the present. And I mean, you know, as a historian, we're almost taught to think on a linear timeline where, you know, one year happens and then the next and then the next. But for us, in many cases, you know, something that was signed in 1761 is crucial to who we are and we have to kind of keep it up because that's something that teaches us how to act in the present day. Um, but I also framed it as a memory because being a historian and living through some of these things, I mean, I was only four when Burnt Church happened. I was only four when Marshall happened, but I grew up learning about it. These are things that, you know, Canadians can say that 1867 is like the birth date of the Dominion. Well, 1999 is huge for Mi'kmaq territory. Um, but it just, it baffled me how 
easily people could forget what was going on. It's like indigenous people from other nations seem to remember these things. And so to, you know, find our neighbors on the East Coast not understanding that this stuff is happening. I'm like, how is that possible? I mean, people like the CBC was reporting on it. Burnt Church when it happened. I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized that I think a lot of it was deliberate forgetting. And you kind of see that when you learn about treaties. They were broken the second they were signed. They were put into written language that kind of favored the British. Whereas our oral agreements that were kind of encoded in wampum and passed down to us were ignored. Um, and so I framed it as a deliberate forgetting because the spirit of the treaties that we entered into with, you know, our allies in the British crown, it's about remembering. And we've had too many treaty days and too many speeches apologizing to the Mi'kmaq to say it's anything but. And so I think core to those treaties is remembering that agreement and upholding it. Otherwise, what's it all for? We are here today because we remembered. We are here today because we consistently push and remind the people who signed on the treaties with us that they needed to remember. Um, and so I think that's part of it. I think remembering is core to the treaties themselves. But I think collective memory is something crucial if we're going to move forward in this. I think a lot of the arguments that are being made, and I'm not just talking about like folks from a non-Indigenous commercial fishery. I mean, you saw it in that emergency federal debate. You see it in um, kind of Canadian settler media. There's a lot of misunderstanding and it almost seems like they're just not hearing us and not listening to us. Um, and so I think that collective memory is where we need to start. The collective memory where you kind of don't separate yourself from your ancestors. And instead of saying, well, I didn't do that, that wasn't me start to recognize that this is like a binding agreement and it's your job to remember and uphold it too. Um, I have a hard time believing in reconciliation, that big word that gets thrown around in Canada quite a bit, um, because in order for reconciliation, whatever it is to occur, there needs to be an attempt on both sides to do it. And I think the remembering part it's part of it, but there just seems to be a complete inability to do that and a complete inability to work with us. Um, there was just an article released by the CBC, or I saw it pop up like an hour ago, where it says, you know, Acadian folks say that they'll never be able to accept the Mi'kmaq fishery. Um, and it's, that's where that memory needs to come in. Because I think at this point, with all of the information out there, there can't be a conversation until there's a membrane a remembering of the terms that we kind of entered into. Otherwise, you're on our territory and have been for centuries. And it's time to pay up, <laughs> essentially, if that makes sense. I'm kind of running on really little sleep right now. <laughs> no worries. No, that makes a lot of sense to me. And as a historian, you know, and as someone who is really passionate about public-facing work, it's always you know, you're trying to talk to the public and history is important, history is important. But it strikes me the way that you're speaking about memory is um, a personal way of, it's a more personal way of relating to the past. Mm -hmm. And it's a more, it re uh, requires personal responsibility mm -hmm. in a way that just being aware of what happened, uh, it's more than just being aware of what happened. That's it's not like enough, yeah. It. Yeah, it's feeling it, it's being, feeling responsible for it. Um, and, and recognizing that you are a product of it and you are continuing it in, yeah. into the present, into the future, what have you. Um, yeah, that's, that's really powerful. So I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to write this article, to join me today. As, as we know, it has become a very popular article, which can be both, both a blessing and a kind of like, oh no, yeah. <laughs> this is way too popular. Yeah. Um, but it's clearly struck a chord. Uh, it's something that clearly needed to be written and um, people needed it. And you've given a gift to the public. And I just want to thank you for that. And so anyways, thank you for being joining me, Mercedes. Thanks. Have a nice day. Bye, you too. <laughs>